I thought we'd start out tonight with just some uh, preliminary remarks from Molly, and then we'll uh, get to a discussion between uh, her and I, and then hand it over to you all for some questions. So with that, Molly, again, congratulations on the new position. And uh, as I was joking in the... <laughs> As I was joking at the reception, this, this means you now have a license to kill in Washington, D.C., right? I, I believe that's correct. That's my understanding, at least. But, yeah, if, uh, if questioning the results of a presidential election were a crime, as many people have asserted in the last year, the entire Democratic Party and the entire media establishment would be in prison right now. The last time that the Democratic Party, Democratic Party fully accepted the results of a presidential election they lost was at best 1992. In 2000, you might remember they said that President George W. Bush was selected, not elected. Uh, in 2004, when he was reelected, John Kerry and many other people said that Karl Rove controlled voting machines in Ohio to uh, give him the victory. This was something that was turned into an Emmy-nominated documentary called Hacking Democracy on HBO, where they alleged that this was entirely something possible to do. But of course, nothing compares to what happened in 2016 when the entire left put out this crazy conspiracy theory that Donald Trump had stolen the election by colluding with Russia. Uh, this was not viewed as a fringe idea. Hillary Clinton said that the election had been stolen from her. Jimmy Carter, former president, said that Russia had stolen the election. Um, the media did not treat this as an outlandish thing. Well, even uh, uh, John Lewis boycotted the inauguration uh, on the grounds that Donald Trump was illegitimate. One out of three Democrats joined with him um, this crazy idea was not criticized by people in the media. They were the primary, primary amplifiers of this idea. They peddled the most extreme things based on anonymous leaks that were selectively edited from intelligence officials and other corrupt people. And it was considered almost your patriotic sacred duty to say that the 2016 election was stolen. And then 2020 happened. And all of those things where we were suddenly, you know, the election went from being, the election system went from being irredeemably corrupt and in question to sacrosanct. Like you, there was nothing you could say about it. And that's particularly ridiculous because we all know, because we all experienced that year, that that election was unlike any election that we've had in our history. And even on that note, we, you know, you point out, our history is not completely free of election problems. It wasn't that long ago, 1960, when JFK won an election that came down to 118,000 votes and hinged on two states, Illinois, where there were very credible reasons to believe that Chicago had secured that state for JFK in a corrupt fashion, and Texas, where LBJ, the running mate, had previously stolen elections. Uh, it's not completely outside the bounds to be able to, you know, just in recent history to think through uh, some recent examples of election problems. And 2000, again, was unlike any we had experienced. A couple months after the election, a left-wing reporter at a left-wing outlet wrote this amazing piece, Time Magazine piece. Uh, I actually wrote it down because I wanted to remember how she put it. She, her name was Molly Ball. And she wrote about how the 2020 election had been a revolution in how people vote. And she said it was a well-funded cabal of powerful people ranging across industries and ideologies, working together behind the scenes to influence perception, perceptions, change rules and laws, steer media coverage, and control the flow of information. Like, it was admitted to in February uh, of 2021. And that it understates wildly what actually happened. So just to give the overview of what actually happened in 2020, I think that revolution really was about flooding the zone with tens of millions of mail-in ballots. And 
there are reasons to be concerned about flooding an election system with mail-in ballots that don't have scrutiny. Like in 2000 something, uh, Pew came out with a study showing that 24 million voter registrations at that time uh, were either, you know, were seriously in doubt. And that's not a result necessarily of fraud. It can be something as simple as the fact that 10% of the country moves each year without updating their voter registration, usually. You have to work really hard to keep clean lists. You have to work really hard to scrutinize that people who claim to be voting are the people actually voting. And that doesn't happen in a lot of cases. Um, yeah, but one out of eight voter registrations is seriously flawed. Uh, and in 2020, we eliminated scrutiny of mail-in ballots or seriously downgraded the scrutiny of mail-in ballots. And we worked to kind of remove the possibility of oversight. So it's very hard to even know what was going on. You might remember that in 2020, there were a lot of reports of people being unable to simply observe the counting process. And that's a very good way to make it hard to determine you know, what was going on. We had to wait days, in some cases weeks, to find out how many people had voted, much less who they had voted for. I mean, it's an insane thing if you've ever run an election to think you don't know how many people have voted for weeks at a time. But it all came down to, and this is what I cover in the book, um, one of the things I thought was fascinating about it was learning it was a coordinated, extremely well-funded campaign to change hundreds of laws and processes across the country. And the guy who ran the campaign to do this is the exact same guy who ran the Russia collusion hoax. And I had spent years covering the Russia collusion hoax, so I knew this guy kind of well. Mark Elias is his name. He was a top Democrat attorney. And he ran, he's the one who actually like signed the check to the people who invented the Russia hoax. And then he also was the guy who coordinated the campaign to change all the laws, to flood the zone with mail-in ballots, and to decrease scrutiny of it. Really nefarious uh, actor. And by changing all of these laws and processes under the cover of COVID, but they were actually the things that these that Democrats had wanted for decades, um, it enabled this other key part of the process, which was Mark Zuckerberg, one of the world's wealthiest and most powerful men, spent $419 million to fund the private takeover of government election offices. It's not campaign funding. What he did is he funded left-wing groups, and then those left-wing groups were armed to the teeth with an army of left-wingers who then came into the governmental systems, the governmental offices, in the blue areas of swing states. And what they did is they registered Democrat voters, again, in those blue areas. They communicated messages with them, tracked them until they voted, had inside information about whether they had voted, designed ballots, translated ballots, um, counted ballots, cured ballots of Democrat voters. So curing ballots is where there's a problem with a ballot that would normally get it kicked out. They would either fix it themselves or get it back to the voter, the voter to, to fix it. But again, only in the Democrat areas of swing states not the Republican areas. And the funding was so disproportionately toward Democrat areas. The defense of these people who did it, they said, well, we funded both Republican areas and Democrat areas. And that's true. So like if you're Philadelphia, you literally get $10 million. If you're the Republican county next door, you get $5,000. So you've funded both of them, but it's a joke to say that you have funded both of them when one is getting such an outsized amount. The other one, it just didn't even matter. That was so huge, and anal independent analysts have begun to kind of understand how serious this was. There were court cases that challenged this, and judges said that they thought that it wasn't partisan. It was not just partisan, it was like brilliantly partisan. And these researchers have shown that in Texas, they, in which went safely for Republicans, but this funding of blue areas generated an additional 200,000 votes in Texas for Joe Biden. In Wisconsin, it was enough to flip the state from uh, Trump to Biden. They, they, these groups, they brag that they funded both Republican and Democrat area, uh, states. But what they mean by that is they funded Republican states that you might have heard of, like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, Georgia. Yeah, they were Republican, 
but with this unbelievable funding that they got and this manipulation of the system, they switched them. And the Georgia one is particularly insane to, to learn, which I cover at length. Um, and then also, you know, in reference to what Molly Ball was saying, controlling the flow of information, I think it's something we, sh we can't forget what's happened to our media environment. Our media have moved from decades of corrupt bias, which was very bad and seriously problematic, into just outright propaganda. They invent news. They suppress news. They played an outsized role in suppressing the single most important story of the campaign, which was the story of the Biden family business and its ability to be controlled by outside oligarchs and foreign hostile entities. And then tech companies also were a key player in that, brutally suppressing information, censoring voices, deplatforming all the most effective conservative voices. And we should focus on all of these changes to election laws, and that's a big part of why I wrote the book, but I don't think we can forget the importance of doing something about these attacks on founding ideas of freedom of information and the freedom to search for truth in your own way and to have information that you can find. Um, these are real, really you know, deep-seated attacks on, on American founding principles. So I cover all of that in the book, but that's just kind of the big overview, and we can take it from there. Great. Thank you, Molly. Uh, I want to recommend this book. I know many of you have read it or are halfway through it at this point, but I want to recommend it for Another reason, or reasons, on top of what Molly mentioned, and that is, it's wonderfully well researched and historically informed. Uh, in the acknowledgement section, Molly goes through the the army of uh, interns and research assistants she had compiling all this stuff. Because Molly, of course, has a day job, uh, is the principal author, but this just takes a lot of work to get all this together. It's it, so it's wonderful for those reasons. It's also kind of a fun trip, fun if you're a sadomasochist. Uh, <laughs> back through the last five years, uh, which I just had forgotten about a lot of this stuff, uh, honestly. Like I had forgotten somehow, I mean, how can you forget? That and the whole Andrew Cuomo drama, where, uh, you know, with the uh, well-funded charts, you know, uh, $5 million book contract, he's sort of the anti-Trump, but as you point out in the book, he kind of says Trump is right uh, every week or two after Trump has said it and gotten berated for it whether it's the WHO or anything else. And then finally, it's, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful documentation of the Trump years, not just what led up to the 2020 election. So for, that, for all those reasons, it's a pretty comprehensive treatment. And I, uh, I wanted to frame some of this with reference to some Claremont scholarship, Molly, and then see what you think. So if I had to channel Mark Elias, and I know he's, he's done this before, you know, they defend uh, the uh, widening access to the ballot as... Um, you know, the promotion of democracy, more access is good. How could anybody be against that? I, I think a good way to view it is my, my colleagues, Charles Kessler and Chris Caldwell, have in their different ways talked about our two constitutional regimes and how we, we're really in a new constitutional order now. Uh, most interesting for us, I think, given Mark Elias's history is Chris Caldwell has said that really the 64 Civil Rights Act, and he, doesn't, he says this a little bit, but the 65 Voting Rights Act too, they both were addressing a real problem of Jim Crow, of course, but they quickly got converted into vehicles for liberal administrators, uh, executive branch agencies. Uh, there were only some at the time. Now there are dozens and dozens more and thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands more employees and lawyers working for them. Uh, the courts also taking this uh, legislative apparatus and quickly turning what should have been a colorblind regime of equal protection of the laws after years of segregation and discrimination and sort of turning it into a new system of discrimination where the formerly oppressed now get the benefits and the former oppressors now get the demerits. So you see affirmative action and all this stuff uh, come up quickly. But voting rights is important, I think, because it, it seems to me um, Mark Elias and his people, the way they talk about this in terms of civil rights and how anyone who opposes the expansion of the vote being Bull Connor, to quote Joe Biden from last week, uh, it, it all makes sense in our new constitutional regime. So the, the, voting, the voting aspect of 2020 makes perfect sense in the evolution of liberalism, and it, you kind of get to this in the book. It's also massively in their self-interest because the expansion of the franchise, as they might call it, favors them. So do you think that's, sorry, that was a bit it, much. There's so but. much in there, <laughs> but 
So I just want to first off point out that Mark Elias is this guy who's constantly on liberal TV networks saying that he's all about expanding democracy. Or you hear Joe Biden say that this is a, an attempt to push back against uh, uh, Jim Crow. This is what we're dealing with is Jim Crow 2.0. You know, Jim Crow was a real thing. It was not that long ago that the Democratic Party had disenfranchised like an entire race of people in the South. It was brutal and it was bad and it took a lot of work to get rid of it. Um, everyone knows that's not true now. We had an election where <laughs> so many people voted that there's a question about whether they were all legitimate voters. Uh, we're not seeing any instance of a single American having their right to vote be suppressed, much less a class of people or any significant number of people. And it's insane to see this kind of rhetoric when, you know, and, and uh, Joe Biden said that if you support voter ID, which is something that 80% of the country reports they're in favor of, which basically means everybody, um, that you are racist. That just doesn't make any sense. And then uh, another thing I want to say about Mark Elias is that he argues different sides of the same issue. So in 2020, he actually fought a Republican congresswoman's election in New York State on the grounds that Dominion voting systems were suspicious somehow, and then also argued that that was a crazy thing to say on the other side. So he'll just argue whatever he needs to on a given race. But there is this thing that I think... You, I, I love it so much, I wish we had talked you know, before I finished writing the book. This understanding that what is happening with, this left's, with the left's push here is a way of taking what they've done to the replacing the constitutional system with this like progressive administrative state and bringing it to voting. I mean, part of the legislation that they were pushing for, uh, which doesn't look like it's gonna go through this time, but of course they're still gonna push for, is to federalize elections and, and uh, give them this bureaucracy with all of these rules that systematically advantage them. But it's what they've done. I mean, you guys live here. You already know what they've done. California is like the test case for all of it, and it's a disaster. Um, but they want to expand the sphere of litigation in elections. They want to make a mess intentionally and then control that mess. And that's what they've successfully done in states that they already control, and it's what they want to do nationwide. Yeah, the, the other thing that comes to mind is, you know, for really until mid-century at least, probably until the 70s, it really got off to the, to the races. And it's just continuing this theme. You know, politics in America was thought to be this contestation between two parties, massing constituencies uh, and on behalf of certain interests and collective interests, and we hope the common good emerging from it as well. But the, the notion that the progressives had starting at the turn of the 20th century was if you could just professionalize this and put it in the hands of experts, uh, then you could get politics out of this. And as you just said, it's now creeping into elections. And their justification for it, and I'm just harping on this because we should all understand what's, what's at stake and what's going on, their justification for it is a new conception of rights, a new conception of human nature, a new conception of men and women, of anthropology, all wrapped up in this new expert package of enforcement. And they use the language of civil rights, especially voting rights, to advance their agenda. So I, I have this one follow-up. Maybe it's too unfair. You can, you can tell me. But it seems to me the impression I get from your book, and I think some of us have had this impression already, is that on average, on balance, more than not, on matters of voting, uh, especially in recent decades, the, the Democratic Party seems to be the party of winning and the Republican Party seems to be the party of process and constitutional rules. And is that a fair characterization? I don't want to be too Wait, hyper partisan. Uh, you're saying that the Democratic Party focuses on winning above and above all else. Yeah. Okay, so I I want to. It's an interesting way to look at it. And I interviewed a lot of national and state Republican officials for this book. And the first thing I want to say that I found just shocking was uh, something I learned in an interview with Ronna McDaniel, where she was referencing this consent decree that the Republican Party had been under for nearly 40 years. And I, it sounded so crazy that, and she's a pretty sensible person, so afterwards I thought, there's no way this is real. And I looked it up and it was totally real and totally insane. So in the early 1980s, there was a, there was a race for governor in New Jersey where there was a belief that the Republicans, by doing some type of voter integrity, had unfairly targeted 
uh, a minority population, and they get put into a consent decree that prohibits them from having any oversight of election day litigation or election day operations for a period of time. And the judge who puts them under this is a federal judge who's like very left wing. He just keeps them under it. Anything they did, like any, if they looked in the direction of election day, he'd keep them in it for a few years more. He takes, he retires, but he takes senior status for the sole purpose of being able to keep Republicans under this consent decree. And it takes him dying to get out from it. He's replaced by another liberal judge, but, uh, but like a more sane liberal judge. So they, the Democrats try to keep them under this decree by saying that Sean Spicer was on the wrong floor of Trump Tower on the election night, 2016. And the judge is like, this is ridiculous. They're free to go now. So this election, 2020, was the first election that they could even try to have any influence in election day litigation or oversight. And to their credit, they, I mean, obviously they didn't do enough, so that we can, we can all agree with that. Um, and it's not just them, it's also the Trump campaign did not do enough. They should have been on top of this years before they were, and they really only take a super active interest literally spring of 2020. So, but having said that, they actually did win a bunch of battles. I think the left is really good at bragging about their successes and the right is very bad at it. So there were a ton of battles. This could have been so much worse. In certain states, they really fought hard uh, to just ask that people follow the, the law and the rules and the processes. And they won in a lot of places. But they, didn't, they didn't know what was going on with Zuckerberg as much as they should have, and that's definitely true across the board. Even people who were suspicious had no idea how bad it was going to be. Um, but it's not just, I just want to say also, it's not just the leadership. The actual people in those two parties have had a difference of focus. And it takes money and, and concern at the grassroots level. And I think you're finally seeing that with the Republican Party people now. But it, it just wasn't there for decades. So uh, there's a lot of blame to go around, but it's not as dire as you might think. Right. No, as you put in the book, they, they hadn't exercised a lot of those muscles in decades. So it took some quick catching up. Um, they, in fact, their entire legal operation was spent telling people not to do anything on election day because they were trying to get out from underneath the consent decree. So it wasn't just that they didn't have the skill to do or you know, didn't have like this experience of what they should do. They were actively working to keep people from being involved just so they could get out from it. I wanted to ask you a media question because uh, you've been at the sort of the center of the assessment of all this. So uh, it seems like the use and abuse, well, mostly abuse, of the epithet that's misinformation uh, has really gone stratospheric in the last, well, in the Trump years and then really in the last year and a half as well as we went through the election uh, and then now post-election. Have you been tracking at all when this really became an effective weapon for the left-wing media complex? I mean, as far as I read it, misinformation to me mostly these days means uh, rules or narratives that Democrats don't like, or the establishment. Actually, even, no, not, I'll be bipartisan. The establishment doesn't like. So uh, my husband, who's also a Lincoln Fellow from the class of 2014, has written extensively about this. And he tracks it to, I think it was post Obama's first election, but during the Obamacare debates, the establishment really was trying to control what people thought about those debates. And facts just kept on escaping from that desire of the media to control this. And so that's when they really started in earnest their fact checks. They're not fact checks, um, it's an absurd enterprise. And it's interesting because they have to get much more dramatic with their attempts to control information each year, and they are succeeding. I mean, the deplatforming and censorship that we're witnessing is truly horrific. It's the type of thing that when I was a kid, you would think was sounded Soviet, the, the, the fear of the establishment of alternate um, pieces of information from what they want to get out, getting out. They are being truly oppressive. Uh, but anyway, so I think it really started during the Obama era. It's getting much worse. It's getting so bad, I'm shocked, truly shocked, that there isn't, 
there haven't been better ideas at the state level for how to combat it, and that there hasn't been much more activism at the at the uh, congressional level. I'm I'm thinking that uh, just for the sake of the country, Republicans need to come out with a plan for what to do to help us be able to have a good uh, free flow of information. But um, there's, a, there's an upside to it, too, I just want to say. If they felt strong, they wouldn't be working so hard to control what we read and what we see. And so I think we should remember that it is a form of weakness to try to suppress uh, people from finding out facts. So. Yeah, and it's... You It'd be great if they didn't have so much power. And it's implied in your answer, and it's definitely in the book, but it's, it was supercharged by the rise of the big tech oligopolies. I mean, especially Facebook, Google, Twitter. I mean, Twitter actually is so much smaller than Facebook, people don't realize that. I mean, most of the internet traffic driven news on the news cycle side is Facebook much more than Twitter, which it dwarfs Twitter. But And their, their levels of control are just amazing. And you, you, do want, you do want to remember that after 2016, all these tech oligarchs explicitly said they felt guilty for not suppressing information because the media had suppressed that campaign to the point that they thought they had they could control the outcome and make sure Hillary Clinton won. But because Trump and other Republicans use social media, they felt personally responsible and they said that they would do what it took to make sure it never happened again. And it was so much more massive than even like the Zuckerberg funding and all these other issues we talk about in terms of actual affecting votes. Yeah, your anec great anecdote in the book about the Google team meeting after 16 was that Sergey Brin said, you know, this was a tragedy. I, as an immigrant and a refugee, I'm appalled by this result. And you had another anecdote. And then your last anecdote was, I forget what her title was, but one of the senior execs started crying on the call. Yeah. About an election, of all things. So uh, I, I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but is there anyone who's primarily responsible for Mark Elias's running wild? I know in Georgia it's Raffensperger without a doubt, but. Oh. And Kemp. Um. It really depends in each state. There are different issues in each state. And again, you were saying like, you feel like the one side wins and the other side isn't as focused on that. There were some brutal Supreme Court losses at the Wisconsin Supreme Court, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, things that never should have happened. It wasn't that the people weren't putting together great cases. It was just truly corrupt decisions. And it's inexcusable in Wisconsin given who's actually on that court. But likewise, Every state that you saw this huge influence of Zuckerberg funding, or every area, it was clear that they were working with Democratic leaders of a given, of a given area. So like Pennsylvania is a swing state. They're working in Philadelphia, working with the, you know, it's overwhelmingly Democrat. Georgia was frustrating to me because what happened there is each, you know, in like a lot of states, counties handle their own elections there. And some of the Democrat-run counties in Georgia are just disasters. They had a primary that just went horribly in uh, June of 2020. But the New York Times and other corrupt media outlets blamed the Georgia Secretary of State for this, which was really unfair. But they really didn't want negative news coverage from the New York Times. I just want to say, anyone who cares about negative news coverage from the New York Times is not worth spending a moment on. But anyway, they... Uh, so what they did is they had this great idea that they would bring in the Zuckerberg funding and help the Democrats run their get out the vote operation, which is not an appropriate job for the Georgia Secretary of State, particularly when it's a Republican Secretary of State. So they brought in so much funding. I mean, something like 10% of all the Zuckerberg funding went to Georgia. You take a state just across the border, Florida, it did not get anywhere near the funding from Zuckerberg that Georgia did. And Florida went from one point Trump in 2016 to three points Trump in 2020. And Democrats really wanted to win that state. They played hard in that state, right? Okay, go to Georgia, where the Zuckerberg funding is focused on Fulton County, the most populous county in the country. And Georgia goes five points Republican in 2016 to one point Democrat in 2020. It was money really well spent by the Democrats. But it was, you know, a complete corruption of our system, and it was invited in by the Georgia Secretary of State's office. So it's sort of frustrating for Republicans to see what happened there. One last question, then we'll get to uh, questions from the audience. So the book ends on a positive note, which is to say um, one of the truths of the 2020 election is that 
you had 12 million, I think, more Trump votes than in 2016. So you end by, by expressing to everyone reasons for optimism, which is there is this populist, nationalist, Trumpist, conservative, whatever you want to call it, movement uh, dedicated toward, to saving America and to using this newfound and expanding coalition to affect that outcome. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do. But what are the top three reforms that you would probably recommend, given all you've oh. learned from the 2020 vote? Top three voting reforms? Yeah, take your pick. Um, at, least, at least one vote. So I would just say, first off, you absolutely have to ban the private takeover of government election offices. That's just something that can't happen again. Um, I would say... I personally am, uh, re writing this book made me kind of radical in my, I know you guys have been doing absentee, no excuse, mail-in balloting like forever here in California. I think it's gone way too far. And I would say having a single election day, actually one of my favorite people I interviewed for the book was um, Barr. And he was talking about how having an election season instead of an election day is like having a jury trial and telling the jury that they can weigh in on a verdict at any point in the trial. <laughs> and it's just bad for, for, the, for the public. Like we all should kind of come together and make a decision together in a relatively short period of time. We actually used to not do that. We had to have states vote across many different weeks or, um, and we moved it to one day precisely for corruption reasons. So I think sh shrinking that, uh, but in general, people want to make it easy to vote. That's fine. Just make it hard to cheat. And making it hard to cheat means tightening, tightening a bunch of stuff up. Um, so I would say if you're going to have all this mail-in balloting, voter ID is key. So those would be my top three. Yeah, excellent. All right. Thank you both. Um, we're going to open it up to uh, allow um, Q&A here from the audience and get the uh, microphone away from Ryan asking all, all the good questions. Um, before we do that, before we do that, though, does everybody love uh, Molly and her work so far? <laughs> okay, good, because as we go into Q&A, that means you don't have to say that as a preface to your question. We all know that now, and you're just going to get right to the question, and it's going to be short and sweet, so we can get a whole bunch of people an opportunity to ask some really uh, hard questions. It'd be good stuff. So, Lanisha's got a microphone, and she's, oh, we are, we're, are we, we're queued up. Let's go. Bang. Okay. Um, thank you. I recently heard um, Mark Mosier speak. He's running for the Senate seat that Kamala Harris um, had resigned from, and he suggested that even though we are so loath to participate in the mail-in um, voting program that in this state we are permanent mail-in voting only, and his concerns were that so many people are getting to the polls, Republicans generally are waiting to vote day of um, to support that, but then we get there and our vote or our ballot has already been magically voted, um, and a lot of those ballots are thrown out, and his suggestion was that this is the system we have, and if you're a Republican, vote the day you get that, turn it in, you know who you're voting for. Um, but some of our resistance to trying to correct it by not participating in it is then the media is already calling the elections and then people don't go to vote and that we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot. While this is our state program, do you think we should use our mail-in ballots? So I just want to say that one of the things I also found interesting talking with RNC people, once they realized it was going to be a heavy mail-in election in 2020, they start polling Republican voters in different states, or they start polling voters in different states, and they realize that there is this huge partisan gap. Democrats feel very comfortable with mail-in balloting. Republican voters don't. It's a real thing. Um, and so I don't quite know, because I don't, I'm really not a fan of mail-in balloting, so I can't particularly um, recommend doing it, but he's, he's not wrong on it. What I would say is more important, and it's so much more important, and every single person should be doing this, Election day oversight is very important to make sure that there's not a corruption of the system. And now election day oversight means election three month oversight. You need people actually going in months prior every day to monitor the process. And in Virginia, which is where I live, we recently had some surprising elections and there was a group of people that was doing this election day oversight weeks in advance, and they realized they were bringing in ballots without appropriate ID. So they were able to sue early. Now, they didn't win the case insanely, because it was, I mean, there's no, it was insane that they didn't win it for lack of standing, which makes no sense. Of course, it's always that. 
Um, but being able to know what's going on early is so much more important. So regardless of when you vote, I'd say the most important thing to do is to have election workers on site every single day for months. It's a lot of work, but it's very important. Because once a ballot is separated from its envelope, I don't know what the precise rules are here, whether you can separate ballots prior to election day or not here, but once it's separated, it's almost impossible to rectify any situation from that point on. So you really need people with eyes on the prize, like is that, should that have been accepted or not? And also you can start getting a feel for like, something seems fishy here. There were a lot of people from this, this one address today, you know, and you can be like, is that, that just looks wrong. Or, you know, you can, you can just start to get a feel for things and that's, that, sh that needs to happen nationwide. Another question here. The New York City Council recently voted to allow non-citizens to vote and they estimate 800,000 of the people living in New York would be voting. How do you plan to uh, combat that, and what would be your argument uh, to the New York citizen that should not allow that that should not be allowed? Right. So one, what, what I find fascinating about this is they say, "Oh yeah, we're we're going to allow people who are legal to vote in our municipal elections, but we're not going to let them vote in any other elections." And I've just talked to you about the problems with voter registration. There are also a lot of problems with actual Secretary of State oversight or uh, city record keeping oversight. One of Mark Elias's plans is to let people vote, you know, register anywhere, vote anywhere, regardless of whether it's their precinct or not. Um, and so there's this intentional muddying of the voter rolls. I don't think illegal uh, res people who are not legal to reside someplace should have a say in uh, in how a city or other municipality is run. But even apart from that, it's very difficult to limit the bad influence there just to the municipal elections, given how people are put into the system and how it's a big effort. Um, but it's also, I mean, hasn't, haven't there been mun municipalities here in California who have done that for years too? Yeah. I mean, San, San Francisco, it's, a, the, it's a mess, vote, yeah. I think. But. Bruce. I just started your book, but my question is... Give us uh, a brief summary. I'm just kidding. No, no. Uh, my question is, do you see the Republicans pushing and fighting back against all these, what I'll call shenanigans that happened in the 2020 election? Because, you know, we're just a few months away from 2022, and two years can go pretty quickly to 2024, where this repeats. So let me just first of all say at the national level, this has been something I've found very frustrating. So 2016 to 2020, it's your sacred duty to say the election was stolen, right? 2020 happens, there's extreme unrest about what happened. And the, and, and the media and other Democrats say, you're not allowed to question the election. And our uh, supposed leaders in Washington, D.C., all agreed to this. They're, they agreed there's nothing you can say, even though it's probably like the number one issue for Republican voters. And even at this late date, they're just scared to even talk about it at all, and it is extremely frustrating. Okay, having said that, most of these things are affected at the state level, and many states have done a good job with at least slightly improving the situation. And one of the problems with all of the changes in COVID, COVID voting laws is that a lot of them were permanent, but some of them, some of them just expired naturally. Um, but because of the angst in the Republican Party populace, a lot of states have worked to improve it at least somewhat. They haven't done anywhere near enough, and they're way too defensive. But um, you know, even Georgia had some slight improvements, which they need to do so much more. Um, but everyone needs to just figure out what's happening there. So, I mean, like Wisconsin has always had really good voting laws, and they worked very hard to um, to push to ban the private takeover of government election offices. Of course, their Democrat governor vetoed their first attempt. They worked another attempt, which is still ongoing, um, apparently. But anyway, some stuff is happening, and California is a disaster. <laughs> but, <laughs> question over here on the left. Yes. Um, in 20, uh, 2000 election, my wife and I were election observers. And at the end of the night, a gentleman came and looked at the list of all the people that hadn't voted. Then a bus came, and a bunch of people got off the bus, and he gave them a slip of paper. And my wife and I suspected that 
they weren't the people they were supposed to be. And we went and complained, and the lady that was running the election said, there's nothing we could do, we can't ask them for an ID. But she said, I agree with you, but I can't do anything. And, uh, and I don't think anything has changed in California, and now they have ballot harvesting as well. What can we do? Well, and that's, that's why I keep on emphasizing this this uh, takeover of the private the government take or the private takeover of the government election offices. What they were able to do was have information on who had already voted and who hadn't voted, and then they could go harvest like in a very particular fashion. So it's only gotten better. But this is an issue where I would say back to what the advice was from uh, from your guy who's running for Senate. Um, it, and I was thinking about this with the Hall of Fame balloting today and all the people who didn't get in because they were using steroids during the steroid era. I think that some of this is like performance enhancing drugs. Like you might not like them, but if that's what the terms of the competition are, you got to do it. So if you want to, if you're in a ballot harvesting state, you, you have to figure out. And that, and that is clearly what your, what your Republican Party did here um, after losing those 14 seats, whatever that was in 2018, they got half of them back by playing playing some of the game. Just want to point out, that was a San Francisco Giant, not an LA Dodger. Uh, <laughs> there's a little bit of a divide here in California, so let's be careful. Uh, you know, about 20 years ago, John Fund was looking at this, if you remember, and in California, we had an assembly seat that came down to a couple hundred votes, and he went out to one address that had 26 votes, uh, and then he got there, it was a dirt lot. So we've been dealing with this in California for more than, more than two decades. All right, we're going to go to our last question back here, and, uh, and then I'm going to give you an announcement. Yes, go ahead. We've all been listening to volumes and volumes and volumes of discussions about voting for a very long time. It seems to me we're missing a very important thing, and that is that the very basis for voting is that you be a citizen. I've seen nothing about anybody talking about making certain people are citizens. I've heard IDs, I've heard this, I've heard that, but nothing about a citizen. We are absolutely, we must go back to the basic Constitution of the United States that says citizens have the right to vote. It doesn't say anybody that can get a driver's license or anybody that can get an ID, or anybody that can prove they live in the United States, that doesn't make them eligible to vote. Voting is a right for citizens. It's a privilege for citizens. But each citizen needs to take responsibility to prove that they are a citizen. So no question. That's <laughs> It's hard to end on a last question that's not a question, I guess. So uh, <laughs> let's go over here to Caroline right there. But right amen. There. I just want to know, what can we do in the upcoming election, uh, especially when we're looking at 2024, with people like Zuckerberg and all of the leftist media, and how can we get the truth out to people that really want to know. I mean, what can we do? Zuckerberg's got all this money and all this influence. What is it that we can do, really? Yeah, so I first off want to remind everyone that the establishment and the left have never done as much as they did in 2020 to control the outcome, and it still came down to 43,000 votes across three states. I mean, it was incredibly close. And people get very discouraged about what happened in 2020, but they should also remember just how close that was, and that was with the left leaving everything on the, you know, leaving, putting everything out there to control things. Um, I am extremely worried about the control of information, and I think it's important for people who don't like the suppression of the flow of information to work as hard as they can to build alternate structures. Now, for me personally, that's what The Federalist is about, is having a different media outlet that fights the narrative every single day 
and works very hard understanding that the media really are destructive to the, the current state of the corporate media are they're very destructive to the health of the republic. But it's also stuff like having your own servers and having all of the back end that's important because the deplatforming happens with everything from finance to to you know who's hosting your site to can you send out emails to your to your constituents. And so all of these things they need to be built up separately as much as possible. Um, and people just need to work as hard as they can to to get that information in an alternate way. But again, they've they've suppressed so much and it's still not going as well for them as as you would expect given that they have all the money, all the power, you know, it's all the corporations. And so um I do think it's important like there will be a change in Congress presumably later this year and it's been interesting to see how the two presumptive leaders, like I don't know if the Republicans will take the Senate, they seem to think they will. It's, it's very likely that they'll take the House. And recently Mitch McConnell said something like he doesn't need to put out his agenda. It was actually the one, one of the like, two things in Biden's press conference that I didn't think was awful. He just kept saying like, what's Mitch McConnell's plan? And Mitch McConnell says he doesn't need a plan and he just is like, it, it, it's just gonna be a referendum on Joe Biden. And I think that Republican voters are sick to death of Republicans just not being as bad as Democrats. And they want a much, like a much more aggressive agenda to fight back. I mean, like the mention on the citizenship thing, these are not controversial issues. These are things that should be easy to talk about and they're so weak when they do it. And by contrast, I kind of think Kevin McCarthy has been putting together like a, and who's not like a super conservative guy at all, but he's been putting together a program and working on uh, like how to actually take the ball and run with it once things get going. And so, um, anyway, that's kind of a meandering answer. There's a lot we can do, but a lot we need to do, and we all we all need to be devoted to it. Mac McCarthy may not be super conservative, but he does have two Claremont fellows and senior staff. They help. Uh, I also want to mention that Keith mentioned the uh, Claremont Institute Center for the American Way of Life in Washington, uh, where it's really focused on a few core issues in the battle of ideas, and then also the applied policy work and coalitional effort that takes place, whether it be with staffers or anything else. And one of the big issues is what to do about big tech, along with what to do about identity politics, what to do about with the rise of China. So I just encourage you to go check out dc.claremont.org to see that work uh, in Washington. Yeah. And let me uh, just give one follow-on answer that maybe, you know, Molly was too reserved to get of what we all can do. Um, and, and something, a resource we have that Zuckerberg maybe doesn't have, which is neighbors uh, who don't have armed guards and 12-foot high walls between us and them. Um, I think there is, back to just a normal operation of a civic um, society, uh, the opportunity to discuss these things with your neighbors. And this is the part Molly maybe would be right in answering, but she wouldn't say, is you can pick up a book uh, on this very topic. There's a great suggestion uh, right here uh, for you. Get through it, understand it, and then share the information while there is yet time with your neighbors. Um, we can have conversations in ways some of these ivory tower oligarchs cannot. Um, and I think uh, just a simple conversation with a neighbor that maybe hasn't been engaged, but billions are spent to elect a president approaching single digit popularity and think, hmm, what's going on? Uh, we can really educate our fellow citizens by the educational research efforts of Molly and other uh, scholars that are working in this area. So I wanna transition with that for those of you that have uh, a book already, there's still an opportunity to buy one. Uh, Molly will have a few minutes uh, to be back and, and sign your copy. So we're gonna have a little bit of time. But I would ask you, kind of Q&A is over, and please let her uh, move through that sort of quickly because we have to love our neighbors who are behind you in line and let them get their signed copy too because we have only a very few minutes. Um, so just before we adjourn, a, a name that has come up a couple of times, uh, Molly got to study under him as did I, and, and um, Ryan worked with him, uh, our, our um, editor of the Claremont Review of Books. Uh, Charles Kessler will be... Uh, featured at our next event, just like this one, in two months on March 24th. I hope you can mark your calendars, invite some friends. He's going to be discussing his new book, The Crisis of the Two Constitutions. These two books actually work quite well together, as Ryan was talking about in one of the earlier uh, comments. 
Um, the regime change that is trying to be perpetuated is being done by the orchestration first of the electoral process, and then it will be done legislative and administratively, as it has been for a better part of 100 years, but at a much faster rate than, than most people realize. So I would highly encourage you to uh, get a book, read it, understand it, have Molly sign it, but also mark your calendars for March 24th, where we will uh, reconvene again. With that, can we all have a round of applause for Molly Hemingway and Ryan Williams?